Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, now that the uh, proximate causes of, of some of my anxieties are at bay, I'm uh, maybe able to get back to worrying about the pandemic and the latest surge and the, the whole global anxiety thing. I'm, uh, I'm supposed to, to go to a trade show in Philadelphia next week for my, my pharmaceutical day job, and that means taking a train, uh, staying in a hotel overnight, and being in a big exhibit hall with a, a whole bunch of people who are all coming from different states, maybe different countries. Still not sure what the um, protocol is for, for that sort of travel. At this point, I figure I'll be masking up indoors, even though that'll sort of defeat the purpose of face-to-face -face meetings. I mean, my work pals have also insisted that I not cut my hair before the trade show so they can see in person what a 50-year-old with a, a massive ponytail looks like. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm just kind of flummoxed by the whole idea of putting on a suit and schmoozing with people after all this time. I know it's a far easier job than than pretty much anything, but it's still just going to be a uh, it's going to be weird. This whole reentry thing's just been uh been strange. Anyway, we'll get to this week's show, which was also in person and also felt like a great schmooze session. Um, my guest this time is Haywood Gould, author of the fantastic new book, Drafted, a memoir of the 60s from Talmadge Press. Drafted, Drafted tells Haywood's story of draft dodging in the 60s during the, the buildup to the Vietnam War. Um, he's a masterful storyteller, and after a chapter or two, I think you're going to be hooked on this one. Haywood writes about his upbringing in a Jewish and leftist, maybe communist household. Um, he was born in the early 40s, and this covers his coming of age as a teen in the 50s, and then really focuses on him finding his way in the world in the 60s. And to avoid military military service, he um, he connives to, to take college grants and then skip to Paris for a year where he's going to write the great American novel, um, considers marriage in a particularly interesting way, uh, goes through a host of medical and psychological options to, to keep from getting inducted. And along the way, Drafted treats us to a, a recreation of New York. Of, of that era and the, the chess hustlers in Washington Square Park and the, the civil rights protests, the riots, the World's Fair, tabloid newsrooms, dance halls, just everything about the city and what it's like for a teenager and, and 20 something. And, and he brings both the city and, and America's tumultuous history to life, reflecting it through, through the eyes of a young man who's trying to figure out who he is while staying one step ahead of the state that really wants to define who he is as, as a soldier. He doesn't make himself out as a, a choir boy or our Jewish equivalent of, of the same during any of this. His, his character is committed to the hustle, even when he gets out hustled by professionals. It's, it's never that he's some wide-eyed, innocent, naive or anything. He's, he gets knowledgeable, and and you see that as his character develops over the course of the book. And there's there's plenty of comedy and tension throughout Drafted. Um, it is not a a you know a book filled with with dread and paranoia about the military. It's again, it's storytelling, um, especially in the back third, as Haywood becomes a copy boy and then a, a reporter at the New York Post, where he's trying desperately to break stories and and at the same time he's learning how to write that is like me haywood's one of those quote unquote born writers but in working for a newspaper he figures out how to really tell a story and the book 
sort of brings us through that evolution from being a, you know, a self-professed writer to being someone who'll get paid to tell stories. Uh, drafted, it's an absolute blast. I, I enjoy the hell out of this book, but Haywood's got much more of a life in the the 50 plus years after the close of of drafted with a a multi-decade career writing and directing for movies and tv a whole bunch of crime novels um anyway we we get into all that along with our respective cancer diagnoses because that's where i am now okay sue me um as well as a ton of other topics we we cover over the course of a, a conversation um I will warn you, this is the sort of sit down I have been missing since the pandemic began, um, as well as I've adapted to the remote podcasts. There's still no substitute for seeing someone in person, especially in their home, as you tell each other stories. The added benefit of this is uh, Haywood's home is in Battery Place in, in New York City and overlooks New York Harbor, and I positioned the seats so that I was looking out over the balcony at the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island the whole time we were talking, and oh my God, what a great view it is. Anyway, that's all just background for this conversation. Go read Drafted from Tolmich Press. It is a wildly entertaining memoir about a bygone time and place from an author who knows how to keep the reader glued to the page. Now, here's Haywood's bio from the book. Born in the Bronx and raised in Brooklyn, Haywood Gould got his start as a reporter for the New York Post. Later, he financed years of rejection with the usual colorful jobs, cab driver, mortician's assistant, tending bar, and writing screenplays. Haywood is the author of nine novels, among them Cocktail, Fort Apache the Bronx, Double Bang, Serial Killer's Daughter, Leading Lady, and Green Light for Murder. The latter two were both Hammett Award finalists. He has written nine screenplays, including Cocktail, Fort Apache the Bronx, The Boys from Brazil, Rolling Thunder, and Streets of Gold. And he has directed four feature films, One Good Cop, starring Michael Keaton, Trial by Jury with William Hurt, Mistrial, starring Bill Pullman, and Double Bang with William Baldwin. His latest book is Drafted, a memoir of the 60s. And now... The Virtual Memories Conversation with Haywood Gould. Tell me how Drafted began for you. I, I thought I read in an interview that it was originally going to be a script, but it was, was a pitch at least. Well, yeah. well um, in those days, I was in the movie business, in the movie yeah. world and the, and the TV world. Mm -hmm. So when I had an idea first thing that occurred to me was let's make a movie out of it mm -hmm. or a miniseries a 10-parter or an 8-parter yeah. so um, I pitched it around to a lot of people I had worked for and this was in the, this was in the 80s this has been going on for a long time oh, really? the, well I mean the idea yeah. uh, and they said you know first of all n nobody likes an anti-hero <laughs> second of all it's unpatriotic I, you know nobody will you know root for you Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So okay. So um, being used to being rejected every day <laughs> ten thousand times, it didn't really affect me. And then I decided, you know, I really want to write this. This is a story that really hasn't been told, yeah. and it's a story that affected the lives of millions of people, including a lot. Of, I mean, people I know. So I know it affected a lot of lives because almost every male of a certain age that I know had to make a decision: Do I go, or if I don't go, how do I get out? And everybody I know made one decision one way or another, you know. A lot of the kids I grew up with became cops because if you were a cop, your, uh, your draft number went up. Yeah. So there was less likelihood that you'd be taken. Some people I knew became junior high school teachers. Same reason. Um, others uh, stayed in college because they could stay until they were 26 and then they, uh, they, they, had, they had their 2S, which is a deferment, and they wouldn't have to go. And people who would not have ordinarily stayed in college, yeah. <laughs> would not have ordinarily become lawyers or chiropodists, whatever they had to be to, you know, did. And that affected their lives. Um, others um, went to Canada, gave up their citizenship, went to Sweden, um, and stayed there for years until they were, until they were pardoned uh, by Jimmy Carter in the 70s. Otherwise, they would have had to stay there for life. 
When I was shooting a movie, a trial by jury in Toronto, I asked the casting person, I said, can you really find me, and mistrial was another movie I shot after, both times. I said, can you find me some Canadians who can play can, New York? Because they yeah. think they can and they can't. It's embarrassing when they come in and try to do a New York accent to talk like this. So anyway, uh, and she sent in guys who sounded like they came off the streets of Brooklyn. And so I asked one of them, I said, wow, you, you've got the accent down. I said, he said, I don't have it down. It's my accent. I'm from Brooklyn. I came up here to avoid the draft. Yeah. So there were like four or five, you know, guys who ended up being in the movie who were actually from the States and had come up. So I thought, gee, this is a big story. So this is a story that had not been told at least that I know of. And then I looked around and tried to see if there were other movies, books. No, there was nothing. So I decided I have to tell this story from my point of view as well, obviously, because I was conflicted about, I felt um, because of my background and my family, uh, immigrants uh, who were patriotic, uh, who felt that, that the U.S. had literally saved their lives. And each of all the men in my family and most of the women served in the uh, military during World War II. So, you know, my father was a lieutenant, a graduate of, o, of OCS, his proudest moment. Um, uh, he was buried in the National Cemetery with, with a 21-gun salute and my mother next to him. That's what they wanted. Hmm. They were also fiery left-wingers, yeah. but they could reconcile the two. They could reconcile the patriotism that they felt. And I felt that... Um, although they were anti the war they hated the war and they marched with me my parents did against the war I felt somehow that they felt they might feel on some level that I was neglecting my duty by not going over just felt uneasy about it because the rest of my family had such a military history vis-a-vis World War II anyway and my grandparents were so flat, were so fanatically patriotic about the states about America and here I was, you know, defying. So I felt all that made interesting, you know, material for a book. Plus the fact that, um, you know, that, the, that I had spent that time, uh, the time that I spent avoiding the draft was a time that I had another, a lot of other adventures, which were somehow tied up with avoiding the draft. I was going to say, everything that you relate professionally in what's going on, especially in the second half of the book, really ties into yeah. America in the 60s. Right. Uh, civil rights and everything else just keep interweaving with you know, yeah. everything you're, you're trying to do, both for work and for staying out of Vietnam. Yeah. So, yeah. so, and also at a certain point, it became more, when it started, which was in the 1961, uh, there was a war going on, but we didn't know about it. So it was still Kennedy's war. There were 16,000 uh, 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 troops there, but yeah. no one knew the uh, advisors. Yeah. They were giving advice to everybody. Right. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, cook it this way. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, so it was less uh, political than it was lifestyle. People I knew who'd been in in the 50s and the 60s hated it. They said they wasted two years. It was a peacetime army in those days. Yeah. They said they wasted two years of their lives. They vegetated on some base, you know, somewhere. Even in, even if you went overseas, you were confined to. You weren't allowed to travel freely. You could, but right. you know, um, they hated, it. and they felt that they had wasted time in their lives, and they were very, they were bitter about it. So that was the first uh, yeah. thing that made me want to stay out. But then after that, when the war started, it became a political issue. That uh, you really want to go over there and shoot. People who haven't done anything to you, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, it be- and then it became more and more intensely patri- uh, a political as the anti war movement grew in the 60s and people started to protest. Uh, there were the demonstrations, there were imprisonments, uh, conscientious objectors, a lot of serious stuff, sabotage, so forth. So, um, it became more urgent to me, you know, and, and became more of an issue. Yeah, thinking when I recorded with uh, Jules Pfeiffer, Bruce Friedman, guys like that, they were older than you, but yeah. they all had the, I think they were Korea era. Yeah. And it was all like, yeah, it was a complete waste of life. I was trying anything I could to get thrown out once I was in. You yeah. know, they, they, I forget, I think Pfeiffer ended up painting uh, helmets w- was his like gig to just keep him, you know, away from, from general duty. Yeah. And, uh, I think Friedman ended up like set designing bombing villages in the, the desert somewhere just yeah. to not be sent over. But yeah, it's, 
it's one of those things. I have a, a couple of guys I run with who were uh, literally were running group. Um, they're about 20 years older than me. And after a few months, it occurred to me, I'm like, you guys would have been 18, 19 and like 1968, 69. So like we were both in college. They were letting college students, you know, defer for a yeah, while. And that, yeah, was, that us, was it. Right, yeah. But yeah, it was just one of those things where you realize, quote unquote, men of a certain age in America, there's there's going to be a story as to either how you served or how you right. didn't. So, yeah, it's it, and I'm a huge sucker for New York in the 50s and 60s anyway. Yeah. So this book is just an absolute joy for me. Oh, so, good. <laughs> good. I'm glad I was. Um, it, it's something I didn't quite realize until a few guests of that same era, like Frederick Tutton and, and Jerome Charon and people like that. Jerry like, Charon, yeah. Yeah, it's like everything they're writing about is this world of New York that I just, you know, I, I yeah. wasn't here for, born in 71, so wasn't here for it, but, you know, yeah. I feel a weird nostalgia for it. Well, it actually raises the question that I was going to get to later. What's your favorite New York? Both, you know, era, area, you know, was there a favorite time for you in My the city? My favorite time, it's interesting you should say that because I used to work in the library and I'd take a break and I'd go into the magazine stacks and I would read the old New Yorkers. Yeah. And I read them from the 30s and 40s. And man, my favorite time in New York is the 30s and 40s. Yeah, same York. as me, before yeah. you were around for <laughs> Before the war, yeah, right, yeah. right, before the war and a little bit after the war because, because New York was, a, was an incredible place in the late 40s. Mm. Um, all this energy, you know, it's pent up energy from the war was kind of, you know, released in the city and the city was amazing. And, um, so that's my favorite time, and I would pick, I would just grab an old New Yorker or, 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 or a bound copy yeah. and open it up, and I would find stories by O'Hara, Irwin Shaw, James Thurber, S.J. Perlman, Dorothy Parker. I mean, I could go down the list. Yeah. And it was just an amazing phenomenon. I was just, it was amazing to me to read a popular magazine which had all this literature in it, yeah. incredible stuff, E.B. White. So that's my favorite time in New York. Yeah. Did you ever get into the New Yorker? Nope. Never I, got a, have, I got a couple of connections. Never, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> I've been sending, I've been sending uh, a story to the New Yorker for, I don't know, 60 years. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah all my connections are on the cartooning side. Yeah, but I used <laughs> to get handwritten rejection slips from somebody yeah. in a spidery hand, so maybe wrongly, but I assumed there was a woman, yeah. and um, saying, good try, keep writing. And I would get those. I got those for a period of, and she knew it was. Oh, he yeah. knew it was me. That's just you know. And um, I'd get the rejection slip with the little handwritten note on it. Yeah. And uh, so I did. Kept trying. I'm still trying. Yeah. Again, so, I, I don't but, have an uh, in on the no David luck. Remnick side. <laughs> I, I've got an in with the cartooning side, but not the, the, the editorial. Okay. End. But, you know, me. I know. <laughs> unless you take up uh, you know cartooning at a late age. But, yeah, really. <laughs> But one of the things I found fascinating with the book was, you know, so much of it ties into your 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 coming up as a journalist uh, or a reporter, right. we'll just say, rather than journalist, uh, coming up as a reporter right. at the New York Post back when the New York Post is a liberal rag yeah. as opposed to a, a you know, right wing rag as, as it is now. Um, and it, it it got me wondering, given the 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 sorts of writing you've engaged in over your life, newspaper writing. Uh, we'll say prose uh, for right. both fiction and non and and movie and TV. What did the newspaper writing teach you about storytelling? And and was there anything you had to unlearn uh, for, from that? The newspaper writing was my education. Yeah. It taught me that, um, and I have it, I say it in the book actually, that the who, what, when, where mm -hmm. is the best way to start anything, including a work of genius, yeah. literary genius. You know, if you look at Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, all the great novelists, right. they start with what could be considered a newspaper lead, hmm. which is on a day in November, uh, Joseph K. woke up and he had turned into a cockroach. Yeah. That kind of thing, you know. So um, it taught me that. It taught me that the most important thing about a story are the details, the facts, the progression of action, not commentary on character, which you're not allowed to do in newspaper stories anyway, which yeah. turned out to be a good thing for me. Because I was an overwriting adolescent. Like most adolescents who try to write, I just used a lot of, you know, big words, if you want to <laughs> use that expression. And I was very prolix. And when it got to the, 
uh, to the newspaper world, I had to tell a story in 300 words or 400 words, a complete story. I also had to create, this was what I thought, I had to create a, a vivid image in the mind of the reader using a pretty limited range of vocabulary. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously I couldn't use huge words and complicated words to describe things. So it taught me how to write. It taught me what was important about writing, which was communication and clarity. That's what, I mean, to me, right. that's what was really important. And you, you have that line about how Hemingway's trick, once you figured yeah. it out, was to, to write fiction as though it's a news story. That that's was, right. You know. that's, and that's, what I, that's when, it, when I started writing fiction, I started doing that, you know, yeah. and it worked like a charm. I mean, it didn't. I mean, it enabled me to get through the book, to finish yeah. the book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, were there degrees that you had to unlearn that? Were, you know, are there, are there moments where you just think, this is where I want to flex a little bit, uh, you know, quote unquote, artistically? Yeah. Is that a. Um, and I assume Actually with, not. With, and I was going to say, I assume with movies and TV, right. it, it would be the opposite, that you want to, again, stay that concise and that much, yeah. you know, to the point. Um, I always felt that uh, my goal was to use words to create a vivid image. And when I would read, you know, literary novelists like Henry James, for example, who I didn't feel had a different goal in life, mm-hmm. and even Proust, uh, they didn't want to use words to create vivid images. They wanted to use words to create their analysis of whatever situation they were looking at. Yeah. Uh, so words within words. And I wanted to... There's a word for it, a Greek word for it. I can't think of it now. Ektarina, ektarin, yeah. something like that. Yeah, I've, I've got it. Right, yeah. <laughs> floating right. In, in, in which you yeah, use yeah. one form to express yourself in another form. Mm. So that's what I've always tried to do. And a lot of that comes from my reading the Bible. I read the Bible every day before I go to work because the Bible is an amazing yeah. uh, um, piece of uh, literature in that with no adjectives. You're talking our Bible or their Bible? Our Bible. Okay, just making sure. Our Bible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Hebrew Bible. Yes. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> they say Old Testament, yeah. but it's our well, book. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, with their Bible, seems to, which I've read yeah. and I find very interesting, but it seems to me just an extended sermon, you know. And our Bible is, is, a, is an incredible story. It's a saga. And it's a saga that's told in the simplest language and creates the most vivid images in your mind as you're reading it. And that's been a big lesson to me. Mm-hmm. That if you get it right, you can, you can you know, really... Uh, um, you can communicate and be totally clear and so that the reader will know what you want that reader to absorb. It's amazing. Yeah. And the Bible does that. And also it gives you great emotional range. And, you, and sometimes you look at it and you go, how did that happen? You know, Moses complains to God. Quote, unquote, God yeah. to Moses. Quote, quote, unquote. And you're just amazingly carried away by that scene between the two of these, you know, people, characters, if you like. Right. You know? But reading it as a storyteller right. as opposed to, you know, Religiously, right? Yeah, uh, you know, just, as a storyteller. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, assuming, but you know, yeah. still figured. You know, oh yeah, because we, we all have our problematic relationships with Judaism and our our families oh, and yeah. everything else. But, oh yeah, you know, I figure you and I are on the same the same scroll basically when it comes to that. So. Well, you know, I mean, I, I was raised in a, in a non Jewish neighborhood, mm-hmm. which I say in the book, which was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, and uh, because I learned as a kid who I was and how the world viewed me. Um, I was a strange ap- outsider. And in this particular instance, because it was Brooklyn in the 50s, I had to prove myself the way everybody did in those days and probably still, still does. Yeah. Everybody. Did. So um, there was a time when, uh, when I hated the fact that I was Jewish. And um, I would try so hard not to be with my friends. They, on the other hand, could care less and didn't even think about it. Right. So we make ourselves the center of the universe, even though yeah, exactly, yeah. and that's what I learned. I learned that those uh, that those Jewish kids I knew who who were raised in Midwood, who were raised in Jewish neighborhoods or in Jewish suburban areas, where they were the center of the universe, and where people like they saw like black people and Hispanic people, the only people they saw in those were were cleaners, were people who worked for them, yeah. were in a subordinate role. And they became very guilty about that, if you like, or are the ones who were, who. who who turned left yeah. without knowing that that was a little privileged island that they lived in. The rest of the world was not like that. Sure. You yeah, know? there's a, the, the number of, of, of meta reversals that racism can take for us yeah. <laughs> that, you know, we, we think we're doing good for people, but actually it's, yeah. you know, this, this whole condescending approach. Yeah. 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 
I can see that. But, you know, I was raised, uh, so, well, I live in the house I grew up in, in the, the woods in northern New Jersey, and there are only five Jewish families in the town. And, you know, as an eight or nine year old, you know, on the school bus, kids were shouting Heil Hitler at me and everything yeah. else, throwing pennies. And it was just, they all learned that, you know, <laughs> they, they learned it from family. This is, you know, what yeah. it means to be Jewish here. But, but I was also first generation American. My family came over mid sixties, I guess. So oh. a little bit different, yeah. um, um, history and vibe than, than you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still that sense of how we define ourselves in whatever ethnic mix yeah. we, we find ourselves in. I mean, I found when I became a father that um, my son had to have a bris. My first, and all my all my boys, have, I, I have four children. They've all been bris, and they were all bar mitzvahed. Yeah, I had to drag them by the hair to yeah. <laughs> get there, but they did it, and they did a great job. Actually, um, that was something that I had to do. And uh, although I'm not at all religious and even critical. Yeah. But still, that was something I just felt I had to do. I, and I'm Because we're more instilled by the guilt of our Jewish mothers. That's what this all <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I guess so. I always use that as and a motivating factor. And my grandmother factor. as well. See, she was they, still around for, yeah, for, for a lot of those. They can push that guilt down generation after generation oh, yeah. on us. <laughs> well, my grandmother pretty much, uh, um, I wouldn't say disowned me because that's unfair to her. But um, she, <laughs> re she, resent, she didn't like the fact that all of my friends... None of my friends were Jewish, and it didn't matter. You know, those old Europeans, it doesn't matter. You won't, you can't convince them, even if your case is completely plausible, which yeah. is in my case, there are no other Jewish kids in this neighborhood. Doesn't matter. I have to have Go find one. My yeah. friends <laughs> are all Italian and Irish because that's the only people that are here. Yeah. They didn't care. She couldn't be convinced, and she, and she, she couldn't be mollified. Right. You know? But that's that sense of of who we are as Jews. Right. And again, which you convey so well that, that tension between that and being an American, uh, again, especially for, we'll say communist Jews, yeah. like your, your yeah. parents were, yeah. you know, or at least well, the were. communist backgrounds. Yeah. That it's, you know, you, you bring those things, but you also have to reconcile that with, you know, what it meant to be American. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a very unique situation. It's, it's, you know, I, you know, people use the word immigrant and it becomes a catch all, yeah. but it's not. Each each person who's an immigrant, if you like, has a very very different experience. I mean, we're living with a with a with experience now of immigrants. It's completely different from what our parents and grandparents went through, and everybody went through. Yeah, it's not the same thing, you know. So, but to get off of Judaism, semi sort of, you mentioned the Bible, obviously, is right. a, a daily thing. Who became your literary influences? Uh, like in in the book, when you're first contemplating going to Paris, it's right. Joyce and and Hemingway, and that right. that modernist set around right. that. What did it evolve into? You know, who, who, what became your influences? Or did you essentially kind of escape influence through the act of becoming a New York Post reporter? Uh, Raymond Chandler yeah. was a big influence <laughs> for me. I guess I'm not the only one. Um, S.J. Perlman, again, yeah. a guy, a, a writer who could make me laugh out loud, who could use prose to mm. make you laugh mm. the way you laugh at a comedian on television or in the movies. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, Dashiell Hammett, same thing. Dashiell Hammett, who taught me how to write a, uh, uh, a detective story. Yeah. Like a news story. Like unadorned prose, this happens, this follows this, follows this, follows this. The words count amazingly. Every word counts. Mm -hmm. No wasted words, no wasted description. Yeah. And Chandler, too. Chandler was a little more, you know, he could he could make you laugh at a wisecrack, yeah. and he could make you stop. He had and flourishes. Go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so Chandler... Uh, uh, I know Hammond, some Westlake on the shelf also, and I always... Donald Westlake, for sure. <laughs> uh, Georges Simoneau, who yeah. is an amazing writer also. Um, bare, unadorned prose that incredibly rises up in your mind like a mist, a mist rises when you, when you read his stuff. Semino. Um Sartre's novels, which I think are underrated. Yeah. Uh, Dos Passos, who Sartre called the greatest uh, uh, writer in America. Um, and you give him a couple of nods in, in yeah, drafted Yeah, well, I was very yeah. lucky to to, uh, to come across Dos Passos. Hmm. Uh, the USA Trilogy, because he mixed metaphors, you know, he started his, his chapters with newspaper stories or with yeah. radio scripts. Oh, he has the different modes of, yeah, of right. and then he, narrative. Yeah, yeah so he, he, was, he was very free mm -hmm. in writing fiction. And, oh, yeah, um, let me see who else. And all the old 
classics, obviously, you know. Um, and I, I shudder to ask, did you have any meeting your idols moments? Had you ever I encountered never, any of no. your, your greats? Okay. Um, I mean, the ones you would have overlapped with. Yeah, obviously. I mean, I, um, I met Norman Miller. He's not my idol, but I certainly thought he was a entertaining yeah. guy you know that's for sure you know didn't try to stab you or anything no he didn't try to stab me but i met him soon after that because i was working for the post at yeah. that point you know yeah that was a kind of a disappointing thing when he tried to kill his wife i don't know i felt like, you know that's too much yeah yeah so kid in the trunk lanes and try to pick a fight with somebody all right fine yeah. you know that's part of the you know yeah the, that was another bruce friedman story from his his memoir that basically had his, his hand on mailer's head you know keeping him back while mailer was flailing trying to, to fight with him at a party or I know, something but, was yeah and bruce was was yeah, bruce six was, three six four big guy, big guy tough guy yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i know i know uh, you know, let me see who else. Well, you know, interesting people got to me, like uh, Gene Rees. I came across a Gene Rees book, yeah. and then I read all of those. They were fantastic. It's the same style. I realize, I, you know, I find myself being drawn to the people who are very economic, economical. Yeah. I mean, um, very vivid in their in their uh, evocations, but not prolix, not overly literary. And Gene Rees is like that. Um, Catherine Mansfield, same thing. You know, I ended up, uh, you know, finding all those, you know, writers as well. Um, and I'm still studying. I mean, uh, Isaac Babel, yeah. who I've read and translated. I obviously, I haven't read the Russian, but there's a very What's good translation. You? you could learn. I could, <laughs> exactly, from my grandmother would say. So learn. Um, Read him and translated. Fantastic writer. Changed my life. I try to make movies. wasted some more of my time in the movie business trying to make uh, uh, a movie out of Red Cavalry, which is a great book he wrote about yeah. being with the Cossacks after the revolution. And also um, his Odessa tales, which are about a Russian Jewish kid growing up in Odessa uh, with the with the Jewish gangsters, Ben, you're correct, the Jewish gangsters, yeah. who were very much like the Jewish gangsters that you came across, that you come across here, or you, you know, or the Jewish mother, or the Meyer Lansky's, you know, Bugs the Seagull kind of guys. So, yeah, no, I, I'm studying. Yeah. I'm still studying, you know. When you uh, mention changing your life, do you, do you still, do you encounter books that still have that, that impact on you? No. Okay. I, I have no idea because I mean, mine have I, still I been going out into my 40s. It, you know, I, I yeah. turned 50 this year and yeah. I haven't had that experience quite yet. But Well, I'm 78, so, yeah. I, mean, so there's, you know, I think there's still... The is cast. Yeah. You know, we're, we're kind <laughs> yeah. of formed in who we are. But, yeah. But yeah, it's it's one of those things where you still have those instances where, holy crap, I cannot believe... I can't believe I didn't come across this book yet. Yeah. And, and you know... Yeah. We well, that's definitely it. true. I mean, I come across books like that all the time. Uh, written, um, you know, uh, obscure authors. And that was the beauty of, of working in the library because when I wanted to take a break, I'd walk around the stacks and just reach into a book, reach into a, just take out a book, that yeah. author unknown, and start reading it and go, wow, this is another great writer who I never heard of, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah, no, I'm still studying. I'm, I'm still learning. Now, I have to admit, I didn't know your namesake before reading the book. Hayward. Hayward Brune. Brune. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that was one of those, like, I have to look him up. And I was like, okay, this is another one of those, you know, this guy was yeah. all that, you know, once oh, upon a was. time. And, yeah. and, you know, did you ever, uh, and looking him up, I, I realize he's part of the Algonquin roundtable yeah. world. Do you have that? sense of, of peers in your, your life as a writer? Did, did you have the, the sort of click or, or yeah, writing group? Yeah, the, the people I worked with uh, um, at the New York Post, yeah. who I learned from, who taught me how to be a reporter. Tony Scaduto is one, uh, Pete Hamill, who I was his, Pete Hamill's copy boy. I used yeah. to bring him his pack of parliaments, uh, coffee, <laughs> light with two sugars, which he had every day. And um, Pete Hamill... Uh, Tony you know, Scaduto. Nora or, Ephron was there with you also. Who was there? Nora Ephron Nora was, was there, there with you, yeah. Which, uh, again, yeah. kind of blew my mind when she showed up in your Yeah, your no, no, pieces. she was there. Yeah, yeah she was great, mm -hmm. actually. I met her later on in L.A. Yeah. In, in Hollywood. It was a strange kind of meeting on the lot. Hey! Yeah, we used to be at the she, Post. What you, no, yeah. what are you doing here? Well, we knew each other. <laughs> we, we'd heard of each other at that point, but yeah. still, you know, it was like... Um, I mean, uh, for me, not for her so much because she comes from Beverly Hills and her parents were famous screenwriters, but for me, it was always, I'm getting away with something here. Yeah. 
<laughs> I can't believe that they're going to do this, which guarantees me another three or four years of work. Because once you get a movie made in L.A. and in, in, in Hollywood, you know, you're established. And it's easier for them to hire you. And even if you crap out, they can say, why? This guy had a couple movies made. So, yeah. so, you know, and if you get a movie made and it makes money, you have five or six years, you know, yeah. you, you're just flying. You're just skating for five years or six years. And if during that period of time you make a, get another movie that makes money, I mean, you, you're you good for 10 ready. years. Yeah. So, which is how I always looked at it. I'm getting away with it. <laughs> you know, because I never felt that I was part of it, a part of that world, really. Yeah. And although I love movies, really love movies, and I loved making the movies I made, still, and, which is one of the reasons that I didn't, that wasn't more successful in that world, because I wasn't really part of it. I was going to ask, was it something you, getting into it, that you actively pursued, or was it your novel gets discovered and you kind of transition into Hollywood? Well, what happened was... Um, I used to play basketball with a guy named Bob Schlitt, unbeknownst to me. He was the story editor of NYPD, which was a um, TV show in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. It was a half-hour TV show with Jack Warden, a police show. Yeah. And one day I was telling him about how I, all my experiences as a... He, he didn't know that I'd been a reporter for the Post. He said, oh, yeah, well, you should come talk to the producer. So I went and spoke to Bob Markell. In those days, they were doing 39 episodes a year. <laughs> even even the 22 to 26 that we see now for older sitcoms, yeah. my wife and I are like, uh, I mean, clearly they're pulling at least 10 of these out of their ass every year. That There's not a whole lot <laughs> but there, they but they're just, you know, right. yeah, now they, 10 they to 13. Doing, and, yeah, they were doing 39, and, and, and it was all freelance writers. There were no yeah. staff writers. So Bob was a story editor, and he had to deal with crazy 39, well, not that right, a group of insane you know, uh, freelance writers, many of whom had been radio writers. So they were older guys. Yeah. Um, and so I went to see Mark Kell and I told him a couple of stories, uh, things that had happened to me when I, when I was a reporter. The one that they liked was the one about the kid who, whose daughter, or whose, whose girlfriend died in an abortion. He put her in a trunk and threw the trunk over into the Hudson River. And they finally found him yeah. and found her. Oh, make that. Oh, okay, write that. Well, go see David. So I went upstairs and David Suskind, the famous producer at, at during those times, yeah. um, was sitting at his desk, and they said, David, this guy's got a pretty good story. Oh, yeah? So I told him the story about the kid putting his girlfriend in a trunk, throwing the trunk, he gets caught, and his parent, and her parents are upset, so forth and so on. He okay, write that. So I, that was it. They gave me a script. I looked at the script. I wrote the first draft of the script, and I was so green that I put quotation marks. <laughs> that's a, you know? If I did that, you know, yeah. and I handed the script into uh, Bob Schlitt, who was the story editor, the only one. He had to handle all those sto stories. And he said, you know, it's good. Uh, but you have to go back and take all the quotations. And he didn't, he didn't say, you <laughs> asshole. Yeah. What the <laughs> fuck? You know, so I did. And then I wrote six or seven scripts after that for them. <laughs> and, then, and they were on for two years. Um, and I would write these half-hour scripts. It was great. I was making more money. Even then, in, in, in those days, they were paying $3,000 a script, which was a, a fortune yeah. in the late 60s. And, um, and then the show was canceled. And all those writers who I had worked with, who I was very friendly with, went out to the coast. And I stayed here in New York because I wanted to write the great American novel. I didn't want to go out and go Hollywood. You went to Paris trying to write the great American That's novel, right. too. Yeah, exactly. You just kept always, trying to do I mean, it. I'm still trying to do it. <laughs> There's I'll be time. trying to do, you know, I mean, I'll be laying on my deathbed, you know, writing like this. <laughs> yeah. They say Shalom Aleichem was on his deathbed and, yeah. and his family came to see him and he was, he was on his way out. He was on wheels and he was in, in the bed, you know, like writing. Yeah. So that's probably what I'll be doing. And um, so they all went out to L.A. and worked on all those great 70s TV shows, you know, which were great, you know, um, you know, a McMillan wife. Uh, there's all those great Universal Wheels shows. All those guys, the people I was friendly with, the older guys who had worked in radio stayed here. And they were going to retire anyway, uh, most of them. So I stayed here, and I, um, you know, was trying to write the great American novel, and I was uh, submitting stories to the New Yorker, and they just said, you know, <laughs> and I, I needed money. So I was playing poker, and I was making, I was doing okay playing poker, and then I, then I had a bad streak, which happens. Only I had no backup, I had no capital reserve as the banks are supposed to have yeah. and um, one of the guys I played with uh, owned the bar he said well you can work it off you owe me $900 you owe me 
you can work it off on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you know, at my bar. So it was a dance hall on 43rd Street in, in Times Square called The Diplomat. And they had dances Fridays, different kinds of people you know, would rent a hall for, for their dances. It was a 90-foot bar. I worked there. I, never, I had never made a drink in my life. I had been, uh, you know, I drank with my buddies uh, uh, in uh, at the Post, but um, I was mostly a pothead, yeah. so I wasn't a drinker. And I didn't know how to make drinks, but I learned. And I kept doing that for 10 years, almost 10 years after that, during which time I wrote, I tried to work, to write the American America novel every day of my life, <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's what happened. And they were all out in LA making big bucks, and I stayed here. And it turned out to be a good thing, actually. Yeah. Best non-writing job you ever had? Best non-writing job I ever had was bartending. Yeah. Um, I drove a cab, which was interesting. Uh... And I waxed floors, which was not interesting, but it probably paid as much or more than the other jobs I had. Believe it or not, <laughs> yeah. it did. Um, and I worked in a funeral parlor. I worked for three years in, in a funeral parlor as a mortician's assistant. Uh, Riverside Chapel was the largest Jewish funeral parlor in Brooklyn. And um, I worked there, which that was a great experience. I, I mean, obviously, it's a strange thing to say. I mean, for me, I really came in contact with a part of life that I would never even knew existed, you know, taking care of the dead yeah. and how that's done and, uh, you know, what you learn about the living from taking care of their dead. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, a, that was an incredible experience for me. I made friends in that world that I still have today, you know, so it was a really interesting field. Also, as far as the Jewish aspect of it is concerned, um, it was a Jewish funeral parlor, but there were no Jews working there, right. except in executive capacities. So all the guys who worked there were Italians who had to serve an apprenticeship. In order to get a license, an embalmer's license, you had to serve an apprenticeship with an established funeral parlor. And then you, so you went to school for two years, and it was very rigorous, and you, and you served an apprenticeship, then you took a test. So, you had, so all these guys were serving their apprenticeship, but because they were not not Jewish, we gave them Jewish names. That's yeah. in the book, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, you know <laughs> I, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah, yeah it, it's yeah, a great scene. Yeah, so we would, we, we, you know, all these guys, Mr. Silla Birdie turned, turned into Klicksburg, one guy was Schmatstein, uh, Mr. Goldflopper, and they called me, you know, uh, Schmaltznik, some strange yeah. name, and I said, you don't have to call me a name, I'm one of the yes. guys. <laughs> don't worry about it. I so, got me in. Yeah. yeah, so we, it was, I mean, and the people who came in knew or I don't think they ever really understood or knew that these, that that the people who were embalming their, you know, grandma and grandpa were not Jewish. Yeah, you hate doing the "that's funny you don't look Jewish" thing, yeah. which I'm sure we both get, you know, yeah. over the the course of our lives. But yeah, it, it'd be much more uncomfortable in a, a funeral scenario. So. Yeah, yeah. So these guys were, um, but then again, they, on the other hand, became. It was interesting. They they became very conversant with Judaism. Yeah. I, I mean, the funeral service then kind of they kind of they, they understood more about Judaism. So it was a good experience for them. Yeah. Well, they also got their license and went off to work in their funeral in their family funeral parlors. Yeah. But the cross cultural diversity yeah. aspect of yeah. it's a good team. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was a that was an interesting job. Mm -hmm. And I I only quit that job when I got the job on the post as a um, as a as a copy boy. So I stayed working there. It was, um, you know, I, I had a big truck. I drove a casket truck at a certain point, too, so I felt I was a truck driver. I was <laughs> driving around in the city, you know, yelling to the girls, hey! You know, yelling to the girls, and I saw the thing, and I hear, I'm driving a flatbed truck with the 20 caskets on it. Yeah. That's a huge so, turn on for for the chicks. That yeah, really... oh, yeah. Well, it didn't turn out to be actually. I have to say, I should have used something, maybe something else, but yeah. it never occurred to me. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I've had a, I had a lot of interesting jobs. Um, I think Thornton Wilder said, "If you want to be a writer, don't have a job that involves writing during the day, a day job." Yeah. 
Because when you get home and start to work on your stuff at night, you're going to be totally blown out. You that was my it. big mistake. Yeah. I, I, I pretend it was that and not my neurosis, anxiety, and fear of failure. But, but yeah, going into trade magazine editing at yeah. a grad school, that was the, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm working with pros every single day. Yeah. Do I want to come home? And, and But it was really just an excuse, I think. But, but oh, actually, you're pretty wrong out. You know, I mean, yeah. even when you're writing newspaper stories or trade magazine stories, you know, it's, it's, it's writing. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you're creating something that's not wasn't there before. And it's know? a different mode, of, especially yeah. with the trade stuff. It was yeah. a different type of writing, yeah. and you're in that, like, you're in press release mindset. Right. And it's very different than, exactly. you know, I want to tell a story. I want to, you know, yeah. convey something to, about mankind's experience or something along <laughs> those lines, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but all for the best, I figure, you know. Um, do you remember your first... I have Hollywood money purchase. Like, is there something once, once you know, movie yeah, money came Yeah, my first I have Hollywood money was $1,250 when I, other than the scripts that I wrote yeah, for yeah. Uh, NYPD, uh, it was $1,250 when I turned in the first draft of Fort Apache of the Bronx. It's $1,250. Do you remember blowing it on anything? Or did you have no, bad habits I, I, at that point? I, I, that I was actually paying it for, I was using it to pay alimony in those oh, days. Okay, so good. I would I mean, I'd pay rent. I mean, not good, but better yeah, than, no, you know, yeah, I no, spent I, all in uh, a chinchilla yeah, sink or yeah. something like that. <laughs> and then my second Hollywood money was, was the other $1,250, which I had to fight uh, um, the producer's a German Shepherd uh, had to go into his house. A German Shepherd came at me and I said, "I said I'm not leaving. Even if this dog destroys me, I'm not leaving. Don't get the money. I mean, uh, this is a this is a case of I needed to pay child support. I got out this money. Oh, that's how I got it. Yeah. But yeah, that was my first Hollywood money. Um, and no extra. You know, I did great. That, I mean, yeah. I did great, yeah. and no complaints. But I never made. I mean, my first Hollywood money after that. Was the five thousand dollars I got for writing the doing the rewrite of Rolling Thunder? They paid me five thousand, and my agent at the time shamed the producer and they said, "This all get this guy? He saved your picture." They gave me ten thousand more on top of that. So, which again, I was working as a bartender then, yeah. and the joke was because so I took two weeks off to go down to the location because they wanted me to come on location and do some production rewrites where they were shooting Rolling Thunder in San Antonio. So I took two weeks off. I arranged for you know guys to cover my shifts because I was afraid I would lose the job. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that classic joke, you know. What are you doing now? Well, you know, I t- took a part in a movie because I'm waiting for a good bar job. <laughs> you know? So that was actually my. I was afraid, yeah. and and I kept calling up. And luckily, uh, one of the guys who was covering me was an actor, and he was about to go out on tour. So he said, "You'll have to cover my shifts." I said, "Fine." Yeah. No problem. I'll come back and cover. So I came back and covered his shifts. So it all worked out for the better, you know. But yeah, that was my first month. I never really. Um, I did great. Yeah. Just not no the, complaints. The mega mega. But the score. mega money that yeah. people I knew would tell me they were getting, and you know, your first. Ref- I mean, there was a guy I knew who said he was getting one hundred fifty thousand dollars a week to do rewrites. This was out in L.A. And I, I, I thought, is this possible? Yeah. <laughs> How much money I are mean, they throwing this at this problem? This guy is making three, four hundred thousand, three, four hundred. You know, he's on, he, he's on a picture for like I don't know three weeks, four, maybe more. And they just thought, but he was, he wasn't, he he wasn't making anything up. And a lot of the people I knew were making a lot more money than I was making. And it's a, it's a, it's a stupidity of the business that if you start low, you can only build based on your last quote. So if you start making twelve hundred fifty dollars, the next person who hires you is not going to say, "I'll things. give this guy a million. And right. it doesn't happen. Yeah. So, but 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 like I say, I never complained. I never worried about it. I never cared. To me, every dollar I made in the movie business was a gift. Yeah. I really felt that way because I felt I didn't belong somehow. I was yeah. one of those guys, and here I was, one of those guys. Yeah. Well, that was the the Bruce Friedman line when we recorded. He. Back in 2014, he said, no writer had more fun in Hollywood than I did. He said, I, every day was just like, I'm here. They're giving me money to do this. Exactly. This is great. I'll go play tennis. I'll write some script. And, yeah. you know, yeah. he did have the great story of um, doing the script for or the screenplay for Stir Crazy with yeah. Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor yeah. in 48 hours because 
he didn't know it was due and they told him yeah we're we're going to be shooting in a two yeah. weeks. You need to, to write the we need the screenplay. He's like, oh yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just working <laughs> on it. And goes running around the block trying to get an idea for for <laughs> what the hell the story's going to. All he knew was it was the two of them in prison, and he had to come it's up a with great something. Movie. It's yeah. a fun movie. And he literally, while walking around the block, saw the two guys in mascot costumes outside a bank and thought, okay, I can work with this. Goes back right. and, and starts pounding out pages right. and, and manages to get a story together. But yeah, yeah, I'm sure everyone. In that world has stories along those lines of just, yeah, like, yeah didn't quite realize yeah. what they needed. And yeah. you know. well, what happens is what happened on Boys from Brazil was they had signed Peck and Olivier and there was a, there was a time limit. Yeah. So it's the same thing as, uh, um, as Star Crazy. Yeah. And they had to start shooting at a certain time because Peck was going to start another movie. And Olivier, Olivier was actually very sick. He, so yeah. they didn't know how long he was going to hang, hang on even. Um, so I did it in, uh, couple, well, not as, not 48 hours. Yeah. <laughs> I did it in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And, uh, they flew me to Portugal. It's another great story. <laughs> another yeah. great, it's, it's the same thing, you know. I mean, they flew me around the world. Portugal, Vienna, London, all expenses paid, lavish meals, yeah. trips, hanging out with Gregory Peck in London and, 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 and you know, that kind of thing. So, but that's a thing for budget conscious Jews like us. That, <laughs> you know, there's a sense of really you're going to spend this much. Yeah. You know, I've been flown, I've been flown to Shanghai, Japan, other places, yeah. and it's business class. I'm like, you think I deserve this? I guess I have to pretend I do. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll all catch on. But, yeah. You know, I'm just some schlub from New Jersey. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's. But um, you know, when I was doing the Equalizer, when I was producing the Equalizer, uh, my boss Jim McAdams said to me, and a lot of people, and so we were here, and Universal was out in L.A., so the executives would come in, and people would come in, and Jim said to me, take him out. I took him out somewhere, I don't know. And I put an extension to the next day, and Jim said, you're not spending enough money. Yeah. <laughs> you need to show more. You're making me look bad. I'm paying $6,000 a month rent. I said, well, yeah. I live here. Nah, he said, that's not the... Just go for it. Have fun. Take people out. Don't worry. Nobody cares. And they didn't. Yeah. The show was a success, and they didn't care. And they and all of them, even the even the bosses out in L.A., even the Wasserman types, you know, the, the so-called bean counters, they weren't. Those people were not. Yeah. They were happy to have you spend money. I mean, they'd rip you off in their own way. Yeah. Believe me, they exploited you, but not that way. Well, that was like when when that first Batman movie came out, and they they decided it had never made a dime. Yeah, a profit. Right. Like it, yeah, you literally Warren, brought in a billion dollars, yeah, but you I somehow. Yeah, guy Warren. Can't remember his last name now. His, yeah. his wife sued. Yeah. Yeah, and there've been other movies like that where yeah. it's the basically they're covering all the other losses. But yeah. when I was in grad school many years ago, they were shooting some some teen movie with Winona Ryder and someone, and they wanted to convert the um, they, they were shooting on campus. They wanted to convert the uh, the little student union area to whatever colors and furniture they needed for two days of shooting. And they did it overnight. And then when they were done, they just asked us how we wanted it painted and decorated after. And it was just going to be done instantly. And we're like, but as part of our budgeting, we have to spend like three months getting quotes and figuring out who we're going to get. Like, yeah. No, no, this is Hollywood. We'll just get it done overnight yeah. and it'll be perfect. Yeah. And we're just going to throw money at the problem. But, well, the craft people that they have, you know, doing all that work, the yeah. painters, carpenters, they're the best. Yeah. Because they operate on a deadline. If you need something done... Uh, you call a grip and the grip gets it done in no time. Otherwise, it's, it's, he's, he's useless. That, that, that grip doesn't right. work again. So all of those people, you know, all of the set people, set designers, all of those people were incredibly inventive. And and they prided themselves, you know, on being able to move quickly and, and make it, you know, adjustments, which you do to, during the course of a movie almost on a daily basis, you know. So, yeah, no, it was it was great to work for them, to, to work with them. So tell me about your L.A. versus your New York uh, you know, I never really did it ever become a, a home. Okay, I never fit. My kids were raised. Three of my kids, three of my kids were raised out there, and they, you know, they, they went to schools in Santa Monica, all public schools. I'm just happy to say, mm -hmm. and um, they were fine. And my wife also was fine. She started a career in, in post production. Um, she did great. She played tennis, and I did great because when you're working in the movie business or at television, even more so. It's all consuming. You don't really, you know, you're working 12, 14 hours a day every day. Yeah. And on the weekends, you're on the phone with people and you're staring True. your hair out. Yeah. So, and then, and that went on for 19 years or 20 years almost. 
but I never really fit in. Um, even when I tried to fit in, like I coached Little League and I coached boys club basketball for my kids and all that kind of stuff, people would say, you know, you're too New York. This was said to me by a transplanted New Yorker, by the way. I was going to say, for us, that's different, though, because if you yeah. hear that anywhere else in the country, we yeah. know what that is code for. Yeah. Whereas in Hollywood, right. yeah, it, it doesn't mean... It wasn't code for that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, you were still just too... To yeah. New York. But when the native Californians said that to you, then it was code. Yeah. yeah. When they said, you Hollywood people have, you know, driven the prices up and you Hollywood, you knew what they were yeah, talking that, about. That, that, that's know. us. Yeah. But when, when, a, when a transplanted New Yorker said to you, you sound too New York, you, you, people cannot even understand what you're saying, you speak too quick, you're stuttering, you're bumbling, you're muttering, <laughs> I'm like, okay. You know, but that was, yeah, it was, uh, it were things about it that, that <laughs> really, I mean, I, I, I overreacted. Okay. For example, when you went into a coffee shop or a restaurant, you were used to New York service, which is you give your order and you get it. You get it as quickly as you can get it. That didn't happen out in L.A. And in Santa, even Santa Monica, which is a pretty cosmopolitan place, a lot of people from other parts of the world, didn't matter. Uh, they just made you wait forever to get a fucking cup of coffee, man. And it drove me crazy. You know, and they thought they were doing you a favor. They weren't rushing you. <laughs> yeah. When they gave you the check, they'd go, eh, th 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 no hurry. Yeah. Yes, there is a hurry. Yes, well, I've been sitting here for three hours. There's a hurry. I'm getting out of here. You know, so um, there was that. And there was, of course, was the traffic, which which got worse <laughs> as well as, as we lived there. But even from my, my very first moments there, I felt my life was dribbling away from me. I, I lived in Santa Monica. And I worked in the valley because that's where all the studios was. Warner's was there, Disney's was there. I found myself lurking in the valley. And then I'd go out there. I'd go out there maybe two, three times a week. And um, I just sat in traffic. And after a while, I found a way to, to actually um, stay off the freeway and take local streets like we do here automatically. But they don't do that there. Yeah. They just sit on the freeway. So I found a way to do it. And then after a while, everybody kind of figured it out, too. It wasn't just me. <laughs> So then, there's, but then the local streets were worse than the freeways because they were jammed and you couldn't move. Yeah. So it drove me crazy. I felt that literally, I was losing time in my life. Right. I, I was dying while I was waiting for this traffic to clear up. And it didn't matter what time you left or what way you were going. You see, here, if you work, for example, when I worked here up in Westchester. When I drove to Westchester in the morning, there was no traffic. Yeah, going against the flow. And then coming yeah. home was the same way. Yeah. There, there's no against traffic. There's just traffic. No matter where you go, everybody's going somewhere. And you just sit there. And toward the end of our time there, when we went to a concert in the music hall downtown, if the concert was scheduled to start at 7.30, we had to leave at 4.30. We had to take yeah. two, three hours out of our lives just to sit in traffic. Not do anything. I knew people who had fax machines in their cars, and, and they would try to, you know, and they would yeah. talk on the phone. I couldn't do that. I mean, I, I, I couldn't sit there and tap out anything. I had to watch the road, obviously. So, um, yeah, that was something that I never got over. I've only had a couple of trips out there. Usually when I have business trip in San Diego, I'll go to L.A. for a day or two beforehand and, and record a bunch of podcasts. And that's literally all it is. I... I Get in, get to a hotel, get the car, and then I'm just driving from place to place and factoring in, you know, how many hours or, you know, how do I get from Brentwood to Malibu yeah. and is it going to take forever or... It's your know, will from Brentwood to Malibu. Yeah, and I've got a story about how insane that, that actually went. I recorded, I don't know if you know her, with Meryl Marco. Um, oh. Yeah, Meryl, who uh, co-created uh, David Letterman right, as sure. a persona. Yeah, we, we recorded out in Malibu years and years ago and... Uh, yeah, that was that was something. It was my first trip out there, and literally all I did was just run around from place to place to yeah. place. And then I'm like, okay, time for a biotech conference in San Diego. I will just take this face off and put yeah. another one on. And, yeah. and yeah, but it's uh, in my LA is very different than, than normal people's. I think for for that reason. But you know, I just let me say one more thing. The, the, the one thing yeah. I I do want to say about California, it's an incredible natural space. You could literally, and we did this. You could literally go skiing in Big Bear. And fridge, ice, you know, blow freezing weather. Real skiing, you know, there wasn't, there weren't the greatest slopes in the world, but they it's were still, fine. Yeah. And with the kids especially, and then get in a car and drive for an hour and a half, and you're in the desert. Right. So you could go from Big Bear freezing to the desert in an hour and a half, and that was amazing. Yeah. And so you could, it's, I mean, it's a great natural. And I'm sorry to see that it's being burnt to the ground. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> that, 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 now, because it wasn't. And that particular area that's being burnt to the ground, Napa is a beautiful area, actually. 
So there's beautiful natural, uh, you know, nature. Yeah. Um, well, even the, the drive back from Malibu to the city, I was like, I had no idea yeah. all of these, these uh, the, the ravines and the hills oh, yeah. and the trails. I'm like, I, yeah. I should come back here sometime just to hike. But, you know. Great for, hiking. Yeah. We used to hike with the kids every weekend. We used to hike uh, around Santa Monica Mountains, go as far as we wanted to go. The great trails, they they really understand that. Yeah. And they love that. And they take care of it. Great hiking, yeah. But we're happier in New York, right? Well, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it wasn't even happy. It was, it was, there was no, I mean, I, uh, I just couldn't see myself. Also, as the work slowly ebbed, mm -hmm. which does happen as you get older and the people you worked for aren't there anymore. And it's harder and harder to sell material to people who are so much younger than you are. You know, you're 67 and you're in a room with a 35-year-old guy who tells you, I grew up on Fort Apache. Yeah. I love cocktail. I've seen cocktail a hundred times. You know you're not going to make a deal with you. You're not going to sell this guy. You're yet. a novelty act to him. Yeah. No, or you're, I mean, you're right, a, no. A, a I mean, to, yeah. to him, you're like a legendary figure or like an yeah. outmoded icon. You're not a person he can do business with. Right. And that's what happened. And I didn't want to be one of those people who I knew all too well, who hang around the various coffee spots in the city, the Grove, for one, Santa Monica, a couple of places in Santa Monica, uh, and talk about the old times, mm -hmm. about the old days, and, you know, and you know, telling movie war stories about what this guy did to you, that person did to you, on and on. Bitter for no real reason to be, because the one thing that most of them, not all of them, but most of them had was enough money to live on. Yeah. They had pensions from the, from the guilds, and they were going to live okay. They weren't going to be doing as well as they did. Obviously, their their incomes were going to be, you know, halved. But still, you should be happy. Right. You and and I would tell that to people. Game's over. You won. You won the game. It's over. You're not destitute. You're not living in a home. You're not living off your children or anybody else. You're fine. You were in the most. You were in the the riskiest business that exists. You were a freelance, I was, and they all were, we all were. You were a freelance person for 45 years, and you made a living freelance. You had no corporate connection, nothing. Be happy. And I was, and I am, yeah. about that. But I, I can imagine, though, it just becomes a, like we said, that, that one big score that, oh, if, I, if, I, if they just bought this one more idea of mine, then, you know, this yeah. would be the one that... that well, you know, yeah. the for one big score was the worst thing that happened to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I knew people who had sold their first screenplay on spec for a million dollars. They got a million, which is not really a million, by the way. Yeah, of course. The agent takes 10%. Yeah. The government takes what they take. It's great, but it's not a million dollars. Yeah. And um, that was my big argument with my agent. He used to make him crazy. He'd say, uh, they're going to give you X. To give you hundred thousand dollars, and I say they're not going to give me hundred thousand dollars. They're going to yeah. give me forty thousand dollars. Right. Because mm -hmm. you're going to take ten percent, and the government. He say, look, this is the number. Yeah. Don't <laughs> this don't is what they're start paying. arguing with me. This is what they're paying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling you what you. He would get furious with me. Right. You know? But again, we're 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 very conscious of of numbers. We'll we'll put it that way in our yeah. our, our ethnic stereotype being what it is. But um, but those people who who oh I'm sorry no, no, please, please. Yeah. those people who sold the big made the big deal if the picture didn't get made which happened a lot they had a problem because they couldn't get a million dollars for their next script yeah. if they were being hired because the studio people and executives whoever it was would say well he didn't this was a spec script we're hiring this person so they got a lot less and if they didn't if they crapped out on the next script they got which happens. They probably, a lot of them never worked again, and here they were with a with a diminishing pile of money. Yeah. And, and, you know, and unfortunately, the one thing about the freelance life is you do think about money more than you probably would if you had a steady job. Yeah. You wouldn't think about your, your paycheck every week. I mean, maybe you know you you think you wanted more. When you're in the freelance world, yeah, it's what it is. You right worry. There. Yeah. You know, I remember um, when when they were casting. Of Fort Apache, and they, so they called Newman. I said, Newman's not going to do this to Susskind. And Susskind said, well, he hasn't had a good picture for a couple of years, but he needs the money. I said, Paul Newman? Yeah. <laughs> Paul Newman <laughs> did, like did a, the movie, you know? Who was it? Michael Caine, I think, did one of the Jaws movies. Yeah. And it never saw it. Saw the house it paid for. <laughs> right. Was, well, he was one of those great English actors. They'll just take any job. Yeah. They don't care. I mean, <laughs> they're smart enough to know that if they do a good job in the, in the picture... 
they bring, bring class. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, you see Michael Keaton in the strange, Michael Keaton in the strangest movie sometimes at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. That's not, uh, I should ask, by the way, because I'm a huge Miller's Crossing mark. Uh, any Gabriel Byrne stories? Or are you about to curse his name because I, I mentioned him? Any, anything good no, about no, working not with Gabriel all. Byrne? Okay. The only thing I remember about Gabriel was there was a... Um, I guess I should tell the story. He's not listening. It's okay. <laughs> He'll hear about it. They tend to hear about these things, but I, I'll tell it anyway. Um, there was a film festival in Toronto. Toronto Film Festival was going on while, um, while we were shooting this picture. Uh, trial by Jury... And I had cast oh, this friend of mine, Richard Portnow, who, who tended to bar with me, actually, and, yeah. and, and was now doing very well as an actor. So he was in the picture. And I remember um, so they all went to the festival over the weekend. And on Monday, I said to Gabriel, Gabriel, you know, was a handsome guy. You know. Yeah. And um, I said, how was the festival? He says, I'm not going to do his accent. Because yeah. <laughs> he used to make him crazy when I did his accent, so I won't do it. Um, he said, it was great, but all the women love Richard Port now. <laughs> I said, not you. <laughs> that guy must have been awfully good looking to, to upstage Gabriel Byrne in the mid 90s. Well, that's take something. a look at his, <laughs> yeah. at his picture. I'm going to look him up on IMDb. <laughs> You know. Yeah, that was the, the the Irish accent. Also, was apparently the story with the Cohen brothers with Miller's Crossing. He insisted on keeping, not trying to fake an American accent. Right. They really wanted him to, and it was like, right. you don't know how bad that'll sound. And they relented and let him, you know, let him be Gabriel Byrne. Yeah, he's Gabriel Byrne, and it works fine because there were tons of Irish gangsters in that period of time. So yeah. it works fine. There's no one questions it. Yeah, secretly. And not also, even he, secretly. Played a, he played a DA in this movie, and yeah. he didn't sound too Irish. Yeah. And even if he had, you know, um, if he's first generation, a little, a little bit of a yeah, leak. He can in modulate it without right. it being yeah. generic American. Yeah, but exactly. yeah, Miller's Crossing is my all time favorite. It's, I know it's not their greatest movie. It's not the greatest movie. It's a movie that, that hit me at a certain time. Yeah, I was, you like to see it. I was like 20 or so, and it's, yeah. it's just been, you know, yeah. one of those things that enters your soul. The question I wanted to ask, though, um, which again comes from a line in the book you don't make up a story, it happens to you. Right. It's the advice you got in, in Paris yeah. from a, a, an editor or a, a guy running the, the French press agency. Yeah. Did that hold up? Totally. Yeah. Every totally. story comes from? Every story comes from something that's happened to me, some experience I've had. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to even try yeah. at this point to write about, you know, something that I didn't really know intimately. Yeah. I realize now, you know, actually, in doing pub for this book, and I'm preparing in my mind what I'm going to say, I realize now that I had never written anything that I didn't, that, that I wasn't really intimate with, that I didn't really mm -hmm. understand, that I wasn't really an insider. I was an insider as a, as a reporter. Obviously, I was a reporter, yeah. and I understood the business very well. I was a bartender. I understood that business. I covered police, knew a lot of cops. Um, almost everything I've done has been something that I really was was a film for, we, we knew about, and I could I could talk about it and write about it with with complete confidence that I wasn't going to make some terrible mistake that I'd be called on. You know, does that make it tougher when you get notes and you have to tell them? I'm sorry, but that would make this completely absurd because this is what the reality is like. Or yeah. again, was that part of the Hollywood? Okay. No, I, it makes yeah. it tougher. Yeah. And you fight with them. Mm -hmm. And um, the way I understand the business now, from what people tell me, people in, who, who are still working, been my son for one, uh, in those days, if, if they had 10 notes, you could do five and they would give you the other five. So your, your strategy going into a meeting was, because a lot of times you knew what they were going to want to change. Yeah. Then you knew that this was going to be a little too tough for them, the audience wasn't going to like this and going to offend people or whatever. So you knew that. Yeah. And so you would say, well, okay, well, but there were things that I want to keep in and I want to make sure I keep them in. And they would let you do that. Now they don't do that anymore. Now they come in with 10 notes. You have to do all 10. And if you don't do all 10, you're out. Mm -hmm. That's it. So that's too bad in a way. I mean, for them as well. Because they don't do this for a living the way the people that they're working with do. Yeah. They don't have the expertise which a lot of... See, that's another difference. Um, you know, then and now kind of thing. Yeah. Then, they respected your talent. They were going to get a person whose talent they really respected and exploit that person. 
exploit usually financially or economically, yeah. or even sometimes get that person to do something that uh, in the script or in the movie that they, they wanted, didn't want to do. With, right. Yeah, yeah. But still, they respected you. I remember when I was doing One Good Cop, uh, um, Kassenberg's secretary called the set. We were on a set. And she said, uh, can Jeffrey come down and bring some visitors? They would never come on a set unless they had asked the director's permission yeah. first. And they were serious. If the director said, look, you know, I'm having a tough day. Okay. No, this, this wasn't bullshit. They would not show up yeah. if you said, please don't come. And, I mean, obviously that wouldn't happen today. They'd yeah. walk on, they'd walk on with, yeah, with impunity. They'll come on yeah. and, you know, hang around or leave. It doesn't bother them, you know. Yeah, do you wonder how well you would get along if you were, we'll say, 30 years younger in Hollywood today? Oh, forget it. I wouldn't work. That's what I'm wondering. Would, would no, you I would work? have to trim my sails completely. Yeah. And and I probably would. Otherwise, I'd, I just wouldn't work a day. Yeah. I would have to be more political. I would have to um, make believe that the notes I was giving were strokes of genius by whoever gave them to me. Because uh, I watched what people do now. I would have to give in interviews. You know, like sometimes I'll, I'll read an interview with, with the director or an actor even. And they will go out of their way to praise... The studio, you know, the studio and, person, yeah. the producer. You go, yeah. oh man, okay. Well, you do what you have to do, and I would do it. Yeah, you know, I didn't have to do that. I mean, I was in meetings uh, with writers. I remember one guy who was a very good writer in NYPD climbing on the table and screaming and yelling at David Susskind. It took me three weeks to write this script, and you just blop blop in a way he couldn't even talk. It was like blubbering, yeah. you know. And Susskind went, ah, nah, nah, nah. he didn't care. Yeah. You know, I mean, at the Christmas party, at the NYPD Christmas party, I got so drunk I threw up. I went into a room. I didn't know what room or where I was yeah. looking for a garbage can to throw up, to, to throw up <laughs> in it. Instead, I threw up on the, somebody's desk. It turned out to be Susskind's desk. <laughs> and I went in. The next, so they told me. They were laughing. So yeah. I went in the next day. And they were going to have to apologize. This guy puked on his desk. So I went in. I said, hi, David. Okay. You know, I'm sorry. I, he's there. Wow, well, some party, huh? Wow, yeah. that's all he said. <laughs> some party that was. You know, it's just a different mentality. I, you know, what can I say? I'm uh, just envisioning the Christmas party from the apartment. The uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, 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 Jack Lemmon. Jack and, Lemmon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, different world from yeah. you know. Yeah, it's a different world. It's not to. you know. Also, which is too bad. I see this. Uh, in the right, in my uh, uh, dealing with the writer skill, they're not making as much money as they used to make, and yeah. that's amazing when you think about it. I think there's so many venues, yeah, that they started with money and yeah, it's, exactly. it's driven down. Yeah, now I know I'm talking about money a lot, but unfortunately, no, that's, that's what makes it all go around. Yeah, that's, you know. and it's because you know I'm, I've gone to a few you know writer school meetings and you know script, uh, strike meetings, and I've had to talk to people about it, and I'm amazed. That they're really not making money. And not oh. only that, but they're called upon to keep themselves on hold gratis, you know, while the show's in hiatus. They're told that you don't take another show because of, we want mm. you back. So they work on six episodes, which is not a lot. Yeah. And then they have to wait and they can't take another job. You know, I had heard that that quick uh, that Quibi thing, that app that was only supposed yeah. to have ten minute episodes. Yeah. The reason they selected that time length was because you could get non-union. Yeah, that's right. Under a certain, I was like, that's yeah. really. Aw-. But we know the history of Hollywood is a history of of labor yeah. fights and and yeah. you know, everything. Well, I've been else. on strike three three times, four times. Yeah, and and of course the last couple of times. Well, actually, the very last time, uh, it didn't matter for me because I'm out of the business essentially. But um, Amazon, there was they were going to there was a strike vote against Amazon. And Netflix, all of big yeah, the big, mega billion guys. companies, and mm-hmm. Amazon and Netflix actually went. Oh, okay. What, what do you guys want? Okay. Will, will you take this? Yeah. yeah. Everybody was st- at least I was shocked. Right. And they did. They made a deal, and it finally occurred to me: they are so fat. This means nothing to them. Yeah. Why you know, give these schmucks a couple of extra dollars? We look good. Right. We don't look. We're seen like, as the guys yeah. who actually worked with labor. And, exactly. We're right. not anti-union. We're t- we're, and it doesn't matter to us. Yeah. You know that's how rich they are. Yeah, and that's it's disgusting. That's part of the in, in every business, you know, when you have legacy operations, you inherit a lot of other costs and, and unions and other things. Where 
if you're the disruptive force showing up out of the blue, you don't have 50 years of, of negotiations right. behind you. You see the same thing with the car companies, how right. they always try to go into bankruptcy so they can get rid of union roles right. and, you know, start over again. But yeah, it's a, um, yeah, it's a messed up world in, in that it's respect. It's a messed up world. And also they're not making, neither am I for that matter, but, but they're not making as much money as they used to make on residuals. Yeah. Because the Reruns streaming, don't exist now. Yeah. streaming. I mean, these pictures are my pictures are streaming all over the world. I see it. Yeah, but the money is not the same right. because you pay a dollar ninety nine or something to see a movie, which is fine. I mean, that's what you. But that doesn't reflect in residuals that have to be paid to directors, writers, actors, and everything. So it's a very small amount of money is is, is given in in residuals now, yeah. and the guilds are trying to change that. We'll see if they succeed. Yeah. You know. But again, that's the economics. That's yeah. there. I remember hearing um, Artie Lang, the comedian who used to be on Howard sure. Stern, he said just the residuals from Elf. He has one scene in the movie Elf with, yeah. with Will Ferrell. And the way that gets shown like 24 hours a day on yeah. TBS for a couple of days around Christmas yeah. and all. He said that that's tens of thousands of dollars every year that just shows up. That's but right. But that's because it's one of the few things that actually that's has right. you know, yeah. a regular yeah. showing as opposed to yeah. just putting it on stream. I mean, I lived on residuals. Yeah. And when I was on strike in 88, I lived on residuals. Yeah. And um, that wouldn't happen today. Mm -hmm. But what did happen, as I just said, was the with utter contempt. With, well, that's yeah. how I looked at it, although, uh, you know. Well, you're editorializing as a reporter. Me. You can't yeah, do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they said, sure, with like a wave of the hand. Yeah. Give him some more money. What do you want, kid? Like a racketeer saying, what do you want, kid? I guess, sure. Yeah. Hey, give him, give him a drink. Roll off a couple of 50s from yeah, the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, enjoy yeah. yourself. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. So, yeah, they're huge, and uh, they're, they totally control the so-called artistic product, and they exploit the workers. I mean, it's a double whammy. They got it all, you know? Do you think Drafted can get, a, get made? Do you think this era is different than the 80s, 90s when you were you were pitching it? Uh, you Ant Antihero is a very different thing. Now. Yeah, but you'd have to, un you know, drafted for better or for worse is um, will be contingent upon it if they want to make it. I've heard, I've had one call already. Um, if they find the person who to play that part, which is my next question, of course. Yeah. Who, and that's who be, would you cast of of twenty somethings who are? He's there, but I don't know who he is yet. Okay. They're there. Because that's one of those things, like watching old film, quote unquote old films, the movies we came up on, right? And looking at contemporary actors in that range, I'm right. like, yeah, it's no. not a whole lot of people who, no, no you know, and, and I'm sure every age said this. I'm sure people said that about Pacino and De Niro in the '70s. No, they that they're didn't. not Lancaster. They, they and, didn't, and, oh, actually, good. Okay, <laughs> no, they, sure didn't, they didn't say that about Pacino and De Niro because they, we they were that characters. Level of, yeah. yeah, no, they didn't say that. They didn't say that about anybody in the '30s. It's funny because we were just watching a movie the other night called Thirteen Women. It's a old horror film from the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, Myrna Loy plays an Asian dragon lady villainess. So it's a good, you know, one of those interesting movies, really well made, well shot. And we noticed that all the women, uh, Irene Dunn is, another, is, is in that movie oh, God, as well. Yeah. 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 Just the greatest. That's one of the, you're on TCM. You just click by. She's exactly. an Irene Dunn movie. Well, screw this. I'm, I'm obviously going to watch for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, right. You got yeah. it. So anyway, um, the thing that we noticed was. Each one of these women has her own style, her own voice, her yeah. own way of playing this part. There is there is no duplication, repetition, there's no cloning. I mean, today, the, fe the male actors, not, not much as female act actresses, but the male actors all look alike to me. Maybe because I'm old. I can't tell the difference from one to another. Yeah. And they're all named Chris as well. Yeah. So there's, that's there's another thing. Chris How many Chris's story. are there? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's not the same. Yeah. It's definitely not the same. And um, maybe it'll change. So if I were looking for a person to play this lead, what I do know is, having cast a lot of stuff in my life, that person is there. That person, this particular person, this young yeah. actor is there. He's doing all kinds of stuff. Maybe he's taking classes. Who knows what he's doing? But he's the one to put this movie over. And if you decided that you wanted to do it, you'd have to find him. And then you'd have to convince whoever was backbilling the movie that their so-called bankable choice wasn't going to make the movie a success. If you could do all that and yeah. then turn out a good movie as well, okay, you can do that. You know, But the first thing you have to do is get somebody interested, and there could be people interested. The second thing you have to do is write a script that they'll think is playable. 
also doable. The third thing you'll have to do is find that guy. Yeah. And I know that that guy is there, and that guy at this moment is eating his liver out because he's being passed over for he parts by Chris. Th- yeah, all the Chris is getting a part that he should get. You know. Yeah. And I don't even know if the people who go to the movies even know who that Chris is. I, maybe they do. I really don't know yeah. if these stars are as big as they were. You know, I mean, I'm lucky that, that even I came up in a, in a period in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, in which stars were considered bankable. Yeah. If you could get a Paul Newman or a Gregory Peck or somebody, you know, or Tom Cruise interested in your movie, it would be made. Yeah. Because they had confidence that it, that, that it would open and people would go see it. I don't know if they feel that way now or not. Was there someone back when you were pitching it, besides Tom Cruise, that you would have, back in the 80s into the 90s? Well, I mean, the, the original book was written about a 38-year-old guy who was at the end of his tether and he's an alcoholic. And he, yeah. the only thing he can do, the only chance he has is to marry a rich girl, which he does at the end of the book. And so when they first bought the um, uh, movie rights, the first, I would say, 30 or 40 drafts, maybe 30 drafts I wrote were about a 38-year-old guy. It's the end of his tether. Yeah. And then um, it just didn't sit well with them. And then, I, and then Disney picked it up and turned around. And uh, they said, make them, make them younger and make him more sympathetic than he was. I mean, you know, my character was a character in the book. And yeah. in the book, he's a, he's a deadbeat, essentially. He's a, you know, he's a, he's a glamorous yeah. guy, interesting guy, obviously. But, so I did, and they got Cruz. And then everything changed. But uh, uh, Cruz is the only one that they approached, the only bankable person they approached. It just puts me in mind of Pretty Woman back in the yeah. late 80s, early 90s, when the original script was heroin addict, ends up ODing right. or something near the right. end, and it's just... Yeah, let's make it more of a, a Prince yeah. Charming thing. Yeah. And, we've and got that this, was Disney this, as well. Yeah, that's the thing. They, they saw well. it and said, let's, yeah. let's make this something a little friendlier. Yeah. You know, I told somebody once, there, a person who was interviewing me, who really wanted me to shit on, uh, on Disney, and I didn't want to do that, because those people were great filmmakers, and I told them this. They made a movie that shit tons of people went to go see. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you cannot And also, the... they were filmmakers for the films that they wanted to make. They could right. knew how to make the films they wanted to make. Yeah. They knew where to go in with the story, where to go with the casting, everything, music, you name it. They knew. They were like the old-fashioned moguls. They knew how to make the. Okay, we don't we don't like it's, the, it's the, the movie movies that they like. See, so what? But yeah, it's, you know, it's still you know. a movie a lot of other yeah. people wanted to go see. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what the, that's the, the, that's the goal. The goal is to make a movie or write yeah. a book that a lot of people want to read. Obviously, yeah. you know. So that's it. So. The horrible change of pace we have to, to undergo now is to talk about your next book and our mutual yeah. assured destruction. Yeah. Um, tell me what you're you're working on next, and we can talk about our, yeah. our relationship sure. to that. <laughs> yeah, it's called How Not to Be a Cancer Patient. I hope it's a funny book. Good. I, my, mine is called The Best Bad News yeah. because I, I got bad news, but yeah. really not that bad, yeah. all things considered. But yeah, How Not to idea. Be a Cancer Patient? Yeah, How Not to Be a Cancer Patient, and it's about my 20 years struggle with um, uh, uh, lymphoma. And um, I consider that, you know, I'm in an area that I know a lot about, so I can be confident, as, yeah. I, as I said before, because I was a patient, and I got to know a lot of doctors, you name it, nurses, the whole hospitals, you name it. And, uh, yeah, it's about my struggle um, with surgeries and chemo and um, coming back, going to remission, relapsing slowly, and I hate to say this, um, feeling that uh, although you do survive, the chemo is a little bit chunk of you has been taken away forever. Yeah. And in my case, you know. So, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, my relationship with doctors, my relationship with how my family dealt with it. But I'm trying to make it funny. Yeah. Because a lot of, or let's say humorous, I wouldn't say funny. Ah, yeah. Well, there won't yeah. be any big laughs in it. But there will be kind of um, a hope in other people. I'll strike a chord of identification. Mm-hmm. And they will go, oh, yeah. Right, I remember this. This is okay. Yeah. And that's, you know, because it's um, so many things. It was a great, I mean, because I survived it up to this point. It was an interesting experience. It was a great experience of life, of living. Yeah. And um, it still is. I'm going to the doctor tomorrow, actually. I'll be a good uh, news. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And um, so that, that's what it is. And it's just about how I, 
kind of w w was in denial, and that's the, how was how not to be a cancer patient because yeah. you, you keep trying to fend off the doctor's appointment. Because when you, uh, what happened to me was, um, I was uh, this was this we were still living in L.A. obviously, and my son, my oldest boy, who's a, uh, was a percussionist, was playing with the Rome Opera Company, and my wife and I were going to go visit him, so I had to go get my passport photo. I went to the passport to the passport office in the post office on Colorado Avenue in Santa Monica. An old woman, old Chinese woman, all in black with a little lace, lace collar, was taking my passport photo. She took it. And she came out from the camera and said, you feel all right? I said, yeah. This, like, this really happened? I don't care. It happened. Yeah. And I put this in the book knowing full well that a lot of people are going to go, ah, come on, you made it up. Good story, but you made it up. No, I'm not making it up. Do you feel okay? I said, yeah, I feel fine. She said, oh, you look sick. You're sick. And I said, no, I'm not sick. I'm just tired of working. No, no, no. Mister, I take 50 photos a day. I see 50 faces a day. You're sick. Go see your doctor. I walked out of that post office, and all of a sudden, I was weak. Yeah. I couldn't walk home. I had to sit on a bench, and I was a big runner and went to the gym every day and worked out, ran every day. All of a sudden... So I went to the, and then I discovered that I had a little tiny bump in my stomach that I never even thought about before. I thought it came from doing sit-ups because I did thousands of sit-ups. Crunches, dumb thing to do. It doesn't work. But anyway, um, so I made a doctor's appointment and then I did the best I could to put it off because in the back of my mind, I knew I had it. I even knew, I didn't know what the disease was, but I knew it, was it wasn't anything else but cancer. Yeah. I knew it. So that's how the book starts with me trying. And then the rest of the time, I'm constantly trying to postpone, put off, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, make light of treatments, or deny treatment, you know, the whole thing. Right. <laughs> well, well, it keeps, it comes and goes and, and I'm still in some kind of weird comic denial yeah. about it. You know? I don't need chemo. I'll get chemo, yeah. but, you know, yeah. really, it needs a terrible word. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that, that, and then it's about, you know, obviously what you go through yeah. when you're in serious chemo, which I was three times, and the dreams, the um, strange kind of um, relationships, associations you make with people, other patients who you see on your cycle. Let me know? ask you that. Yeah. Because I'm just starting this whole thing now, yeah. and I'm very lucky. Again, the best bad news. Yeah. Uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Right now, it's come back every six months yeah. for blood work unless you show symptoms, which, yeah. of course, is a neurotic Jew. I will right. start imagining everything is yeah. a goddamn symptom. But yeah. protocol, when you're sitting in the waiting area yeah. in a cancer clinic. Yeah. Fantastic. Do you look at the other people? Do you? No. Because every, to me, everybody is there for something far I mean, you, worse you than me. I sneak looks. Yeah. Because you want to see how sick they look. They're like rates, and, some of them. Yeah. It's, it's, you, would you yeah. have your magazine or your phone at this point, more than a magazine, but uh, you're looking at, you can yeah. bury yourself more in a, mag, in a phone than a magazine, too, in, in a way. A magazine, you've got to look up turn pages, you look up, phone, you can go like this yeah. you know you can just be totally buried in it with, with your face in it almost yeah. um, you don't look at each other but what happens to you when you're in chemo is that you're in the same cycle as other people mm -hmm. so if you're going let's say which I was going twice a week every three weeks you see the same people yeah and um, not right away but after a period of time you get to know them and you get to say hello to them. Then if the period of time goes even further than that, you get to talk to them. And you get some kind of relationship with them. I had a, It's in the book. I don't want to give no, it away. No, but I had some interesting things happen to me. Also, I was in chemo on 9-11. So, still out in L.A.? Or were you back here? In L.A. Okay. Yeah. So I went to, uh, you know, I went for my chemo session. And they had hit the, uh, what do you call it, the, the earlier... And uh, at this point, I think both planes, well, I know that both planes had flown into the buildings, but the debris was still there. So we sat with the needles in our arms on our chairs, and Just they brought televisions in. And there was a cop who used to come for treatment, he, and he was, talk about denial, he'd come with his full uniform on. Because that's going to protect him. Yeah, and, and the doctors and the, the nurses told him, Look, I mean, would you just leave your gun in the car? I mean, nothing's going to... He said, no, no, it's part of my uniform. Finally, he stopped doing it. Yeah. 
Yeah. He's, they kept left his gun at home. And then he even left, didn't come in uniform, you know. But um, he started singing God Bless America, and we all sang God Bless America while we were watching the yeah. burning, burning, the buildings burn down. And um, I thought to myself, this is something no one would ever believe. I could not put this in a script. Yeah. But I can, and I do, obviously, put it in a book because it really happened. Right. And we sat there singing God Bless America. You know, and these yeah. people, some of whom, you know, I stopped seeing after a while, you know, yeah. Yeah. I didn't see them. So, and they were, it was, the way this, is, the way this particular treatment room at the, John, at the John Wayne Cancer Center was laid out was, there was a, there was a mass, there was a large treatment room, which all the people sat in, and we looked at each other, we could see each other. And then there were, there were rooms along the outer edge for people who were so sick that they couldn't, yeah. you know, sit. And those are people, you'd see them as you walked, you know, to your seat. You'd see them down the hall, down the corridor. As the door opened just a little bit, you could look in and you could see people laying there. And, man, I got to tell you. So, you really... That was my my first trip. My first visit to the oncologist just to get diagnosed. A woman came walking by and it was just that moment of... Uh, and I'd been worst case scenarioing myself yeah. for about ten days from the doctor's appointment to this because we yeah. didn't, we knew something was up from yeah. just from blood tests, no symptoms. Yeah, blood tests, right? But it was just this. It's going to be the worst case. I'm going to have six months, and yeah. I'm going to go in and find this out. And she's like, "Oh no, you got CLL. Uh, you're going to be fine. You're you're 50. You ran six miles this morning. Everything's okay. Just you know, yeah. we'll do some cyto uh, yeah, the cytogenetics. Well, as long as they give you the treatment." <laughs> Yeah, the right the, treatment. The, the, right. That, that was yeah. her whole thing. So yeah. your yeah. numbers are nowhere near right. needing treatment. Everything's fine. Yeah. Come back every six. But it was that moment of walking in and seeing yeah. the people there. And it's yeah. just, is this going to be me? You know, uh, am I going in that direction? Am I, you know, I'm well, you in the know, wrong you place. Go, you know, you that, go, that I mean, sort of I, thing. You, yeah. right. You, you, yeah. it, it, it's incredible. But the one thing it does do you is it teaches you, I mean, at least I felt that way. You form a bond with those people. And even the people that you see, that I see now that I'm not in chemo, when I go, you know, on the, on the bi-monthly move, I got to get my port flushed out and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, even the the people you see there, you have a relationship with them. They recognize you, you recognize them, you kind of nod. There's no talking, there's no friendship, not going to be friends. But at the same time, there's a great feeling of, what's the word? See, camaraderie. Yeah, I was just about to say a sort of yeah. fraternity you belong yeah. to. Yeah, you yeah. really feel that way. Yeah. And you feel great sympathy for each other. And they for you and you for them. Yeah. You know, and when they call you to get up, especially me, because I have to have the cane and everything, when they call you to come in and you get up and you labor to your feet and everything, everybody looks at you, hey, how you Yeah, he'll be okay. Or be do okay. I have to, you know, get Yeah, my how hand. you doing? Yeah. And the nurses yeah. too, the nurses are great. But um yeah, no, you obviously you can die from it, so you don't want to have it. But <laughs> no. I mean the thing that the thing that I remember, I remember even on the um, the first scan I took, which I tried to duck, um, and they they said to me, uh, you know, you want you have to keep your arms over your head for fifteen twenty minutes. Yeah, the, the CT. I, I, I was a weightlifter. I had no problem. Well, I don't know if I can do that or not. Well, we if you can't, you know, they must have known, seen this before. Yeah, you know, avoidance, got people avoiding. So and anyway, but when I got in there and I had my arms over my head and it's very very kind of claustrophobic area. I'm sorry, I just touched the oh, mic. Okay. Um, I remember that my father had been claustrophobic. I remembered a taking him to a birthday party. This is in the book. Taking him to a birthday party at the at the Rainbow Room, which is a, was a fancy place in those days, and yeah. uh, in the RCA on top of the RCA building. It's a great place, actually. I remember taking him and being in, in the elevator with him. The elevator got stuck between floors, and it was and the operator as he said, had overloaded the elevator. And he got into a bit of a claustrophobic panic, which I never... I knew that he'd been claustrophobic because he told me the story about how he'd been a troop ship going overseas and 500 guys all jammed together, yeah. you know. And so, and that's when he got it. And But I'd never seen him. And that's... Well, I was laying there like this in this little, you know, kind of constricted area. That whole incident came into my head, remembering how panicky he was, how he was sweating... How he yielded the operator and kind of lost control of himself a little bit, yeah. and the door finally opened. We all got out, obviously. Was it, yeah. So yeah, and from then on, the whole period of chemo, scans, surgery became a period of remembering similar incidents in my life, 
similar uh, relationships, similar emotional reactions to things. It was always an association that I had, and still have, with other things that had happened to me, many of which, like this particular incident, my father did not remember that it happened at yeah. all. And I was with him. Yeah. So that became an interesting kind of memoiristic. Yeah. Not that I could have I wanted to have it. First, but, except with, with yeah, lucasites first, instead exactly, of metal. Yeah, that's well, it. It's another know. guy who had it from, from TV. Yeah. He's yeah. Said, right. And in the same way he... But so, so making all um, those connections yeah. and associations. So, yeah. but, and it's interesting how you, you have feelings about it, you have emotional kind of references to other things that happened to you in your life. You know, I mean, so anyway, yeah. So that'll be the next time. If I don't talk to you before then, right, um, yeah. I will have you on definitely. Provided, you know, I don't progress and you don't progress and we're, we're both in good shape. Well, we you will won't sit progress. Down again. Uh, so they've told, and, and trust me, when I, I talked about it publicly, the amount of people emailing me saying, oh, God, I went 20 years without progressing. Or my father had it 30 years. Nothing ever happened. He died yeah, of something some else. some guy died, too, you know. So, that's I mean, my thing. Really I always assume, can't. as a neurotic <laughs> Jew, I'm the guy who thinks well, the roof is going to fall. I mean, it's true. Yeah. And that's the, you know. I guess, the, the meta question I should ask, unless it's something you answer in, in the next book. Um, did you think of what the end meant and what you wanted to do before the end. No, if it I was coming. what I wanted to I mean, bucket list? <laughs> no. Well, that, no. That, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a weird, no. when, when the end becomes a defined thing as opposed yeah. to the open-endedness that we, yeah. we ascribe to life. No, I didn't because I've seen people die. Yeah. That's um, true. You've been around, the, you were around the dead. From, yeah, I've from been your, around the dead. I've seen people die. I saw my father die, speaking yeah. of dying. And, um, and my mother, for that matter, although I wasn't in the room exactly at that moment. Um, the only thing I thought about was, well, you know, because what happens with lymphoma is if you, the chemos don't work, you know, they try uh, to do a stem cell transplant. Yeah. And it doesn't, it's not too, you know, seniors don't have a good uh, history yeah. with stem So I'm a senior, I'm 78. So if it happens again, and uh, this time around, uh, it happened, and I had surgery, and they took out two of my ribs, and which I really hate that they did that because it totally screwed up my gym work. I, I, I was going to say stuff. your abs get shot at that yeah, point. You don't I, have a six-pack anymore. That's, I know. That's, I, can do, yeah. I never had a six-pack, <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't have a piece of Gore-Tex sticking out of my... But anyway, um, yeah, so the only thing I thought about, frankly, this is just me. Yeah. Everybody has their own feeling was, they'll give me a drug. I don't go to sleep. Yeah. And what will happen is I won't know I'm dying because that's something that I've noticed with dying people, including some friends, a good friend of mine who I saw die, didn't know he was dying. No one told him. Yeah. He just died. He thought, you know, I'll have pork chops for dinner tonight, whatever, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all I thought about. Um, when, if and when they finally tell you you're on your way out, I don't know how, how I'll respond. But um, I hope um, I respond with acceptance yeah. and that I and, and I do know that it'll be a painless death so that's all that's all you can say you know and you also know when you get to my age because I'm 78 you get to my age I mean you could die of a lot of other things too while you're at it yeah you're not a young guy right. so just chill out don't worry about it you know, just do it you know that's, I mean yeah. go through it just yeah. do it and that's it and that's the feeling you get with the although it's never spoken when you talk to other people about it, people who've had it, and they go, yeah, yeah. I mean, my thing is, you know, morphine. As a matter of fact, my father developed pneumonia, and the nurse who came in, the home care nurse who came in, said to me, this is the old person's friend. Yeah. They close the right, there's no pain. There's no shortness of breath with pneumonia. There's nothing. You just go out. You just slide out. It's like that movie, Soylent Green. Did you see Soylent Green? <laughs> yeah. It's a great movie. Yeah. Edward G. Robinson, they play some, they run a nice little landscape that he likes, they play his favorite music, and off he goes, slides into the, uh, you know, yeah. into the processor, <laughs> the food processor, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Mm. You know, I mean, um, also I think you think if you have kids and grandchildren, not so much grandchildren because they won't even know, but my kids yeah. who are grown up, in a way... That's he, part of my thing. I don't have kids, so yeah. I assume everybody... People who have children are going to see things a lot differently yeah, because you you've thought about continuity in time. Well, or also, you, yeah. you want to make sure that you're a good example to them. Yeah. 
You don't want them to see their dad or mom on upset, yeah. crying, you know, in pain. It'll haunt them for the rest of their lives. Right. If they see you make a, a fairly, you know, Dignified. serene yeah. departure, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. it's better for them when their time comes. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I always tell my kids about my father. My father um, had had enough. And they took him to a, to a hospital in Albuquerque. It's in the book, but I'll say it now. And they took him to a hospital in Albuquerque. And um, he told the doctor, I, I have a lot of pain. But she didn't. And the doctor in Albuquerque, Albuquerque is a great place. It's geezer friendly, as my father used to say. <laughs> yeah. You know, when my father said, he's an old Brooklyn guy from way, the Bronx guy, actually, from way back. And he'd say, he never got away the fact that when he was in a supermarket, you know, wheeling his car to the car, people would come over and say, can I help you load your car? So that's Albuquerque. Yeah. And it is, that is Albuquerque. So they had all kinds of home care and people would come. And, um, you know, he just told this doctor, I have a lot of pain. The doctor gave him enough, you know, morphine to do it. Yeah. And he took it. And he was in his late, he was going to be 89. Hmm. And, you know, he'd, he'd had one setback after another. And he had been a tough guy, rough, good guy, never got sick a day in his life. So, you know, I saw that and, and my kids asked me, how did you feel? Like, you know what I felt? Grandpa taught me the last lesson that he could teach me. He taught me a lot of stuff. Now he taught me how to die. This is how to die. It's a good lesson to learn because other people are going to be watching you. I told them that. But in your case, no. Okay, fine. No. Maybe, maybe your wife or a friend will be watching you. Same thing. It's not quite as intense because it's not a family thing. That's but that's how I feel about it. And that's, that'll be in the book, too. I just told you the book. I, I know, the book don't, don't worry. You still okay. got to write it. I, okay. I, I only okay. wrote a, a short list of ironies about my, my condition. <laughs> One was when I thought it was going to be chemo, that, you know, I spent a year and a half growing all this hair out. Now it's all going to get, you know, falling in. As it, it turns comes out, back stronger. Well, as it turns out, I won't need, even if I progress, they right. do targeted therapies that yeah. don't use chemo anymore, but blah, right. blah, blah. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, my immediate thing was to, st like I, I said before we started recording, of all the ways I could emulate Clive James, getting right. the same cancer was not exactly what I thought, you know, was going to be the, the direction to go yeah. in. But, you know. No, well, I, I felt, I, I, mean, I mean, I've read some of the pieces that he wrote about it. I felt they kind of dramatized it. I mean, sure, it's a dramatic moment in your life, but... Um, it's more important for people to see how you respond in a positive way, how yeah. you continue living that moment he did beyond keep, your He did keep writing uh, non-death non stuff, right. and he wrote new poetry and right. all that. So he, he did yeah. balance yeah. the commentary about cancer yeah. with continuing to make right. art or make you know great writing. Right, because the, thing, the yeah. thing about cancer is, and I'll say, boy, I'm saying, I don't like the book <laughs> Again, anyway. people forget by the time the book comes out, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, I'm giving myself ideas as I'm talking. So oh, good, okay. Good. You know, the thing about cancer is the thing is the treatment. Yeah. And now that they've uh, the treatment is brutal, so you know it's just it's not getting around it. And then if you add surgery to it, it's even worse. But um, you know it's tough, and you you you're sick as a dog, can't get around it. And nothing you take really helps because uh, they give you. Um, a nausea medicine, but it constipates you. And, and then that's complicated. If you're a good Jewish yeah. kid, you, the worst thing that happened to you is to be constipated. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, uh, and that's the thing that separates it. Because if you're of a certain age, like I am, there are a lot of things you can die from. You can die from congestive heart failure, and yeah. people are dying from it every day, and all kinds of things. In this case, before you die, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's. And there's no way around it. Right. They are working on, you know... Uh, no, there's all sorts of things in the... Yeah, that's part know, of my day job immune, is the, the, you know, the R&D pipeline. kind but, of stuff. And, yeah. and they're working on a lot of stuff. And, and eventually they'll find a way to cure it by just targeting cancer cells. And yeah. They're getting closer to that now. Yeah. But it hasn't come yet. Yeah. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. So we can end on a, a slightly better note. Besides Torah, what else are you reading? Right now... Or lately. I'm reading a, bio, a, 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 a memoir of a Yiddish poet named Ruben Iceland. Don't know. I mean, this is like, it's translated, obviously, who was part of a group of Yiddish poets in the, uh, at the turn of the century into the 20s and 30s in New York who had a group called the Junga, the Young Ones, yeah. who uh, were, who wrote, who tried to write 
what he describes as non-nationalistic, non-religious poetry and prose in Yiddish. Tried to make a literary language, not a religious language or yeah. his word superstitious. He was language. And so it's very interesting. He tells these stories of what life is like in that ferment of Yiddish culture in the low, on the Lower East Side in the you know, early um, a, a 20th century teens, 20s, yeah. even into the 40s during the war, actually, World War II. So I'm reading that right now. Um, I'm also reading a biography of, of Trotsky. I've always intended to do that, and now yeah. I'm going to do it. And it's a very interesting biography of Trotsky. And um, as I always do, um, I'm trying to get through Shakespeare again. So now I'm up to two gentlemen from Verona. See, so, yeah, I'm still in that maybe 18 or 19 plays total, and I know I need to read some of the lesser ones and, and go back and start reading the greats again. But yeah. I, I still keep a running list of how many Shakespeare plays I've read and how many major league ballparks I've been to, and they're oh, pretty neck great. and neck, around like 19 or 20. Well, that's uh, good. Piece. So, yeah. yeah, especially because I'm not traveling anywhere, so yeah. there's not going to be any more ball games for yeah. a while. I, I should probably spend time on Shakespeare and really bulk up that well, side of the list. they're letting people in now. They're letting people in. Yeah, Camden but it's having yards. to go places. Yeah. I think shows not shows them. City Field is letting yeah, people. Yeah, I haven't in. been to the new. I don't think I haven't been to the new Shea or yeah, the new City Field great. yet. Yeah, you know, I've been to the new Yankee Stadium. Are you a fan? I'm a Yankees guy. Um, You're a Yankee I, fan. I, yeah, well, I was raised in the '70s. I had no American lineage before 1965 when my parents got here. So, you know, having Reggie Thurman Munson yeah. and and Ron yeah. Gidry and all that. Gidry, it turns out, I'm now distantly related to by marriage. Uh, I married a, a Cajun from Louisiana. Oh, wow. Great. And, well, she has a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny thing. Being down there, I'm like, I... I'm used to this accent being yeah. from up here. I'm yeah. not quite sure where that comes from for yeah. you guys. But, yeah, it turns out we're a, a big mix of, of ethnicities in America. But, yeah, we are distantly related to Ron Guidry. So I've got a, a 70s Yankee thing, uh, which is carried over. For, well, I'm a Yankee hater from Brooklyn. For oh, reason. and that's, that's fine. Yeah. No, yeah, everybody I mean, hates the Yankees. I'm not a Mets fan because I, for the same, same reason, I guess. Yeah, the team yeah. that's left. Yeah, you know, but I'm a fan. Here. But, yeah, I've got a, about 19 or 20 ballparks. I've still got to do a oh, whole bunch great. of Midwestern ones. and I've got a bunch of clients out in... Got in in uh, Ohio and Minnesota and places like that. Oh, I'm okay. like, yeah, I should go visit you guys and go to ball games yeah, and, and game, finally right. see you know yeah. all these other fields. But yeah, that'll be the the post pandemic time. But well, until then, you and I got to get together and and you know sit down for another conversation. Okay, great. I'm sure. sure. But hey, would I enjoy the hell out of uh, drafted? Oh, like so I said. Great. And like I said, I'm a huge sucker for 50s and 60s New Good. York anyway. But yeah, Good. this book was an absolute joy. So yeah, okay, thanks Good. so much for coming on. This was great. Good. Thanks for coming around. I think I, I think I spilled my guts. <laughs> I always do that. I always tell myself, <laughs> stick to the program, the strategy. But there is no strategy. Strategy is spill your guts. That's the strategy. It's conversation. Know? We're conversation, here to just yeah. have a nice conversation. Yeah. So. And that was Haywood Gold. His new book is Drafted, a memoir of the 60s, and it's a blast. You can find it at better bookstores and through all the, the usual online stores like bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, and, and the like. You can find out more about the book, as well as Haywood's crime novels, nonfiction, Hollywood career, scripts that'll never be produced, and more. Uh, it's all at his website, haywoodgould.com, which is H E Y. W-O-O-D-G-O-U-L-D dot com. And there'll be a link to that in the show and episode notes for this one. Near as I can tell, Haywood does not have a social media presence, but as we all know, he's probably happy, happier than we are because of that. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories show by telling other people about it and by sending me postcards, letters, or emails, or by leaving a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about me picking up and, and getting stuck in a conversation with me. Um, but however you reach out, just tell me what's going on. Tell me what you like and don't like about the show, who you'd like to hear me record with, what movie or TV show or book or comic or piece of music you think I should turn listeners on to. Um, I love the feedback. I love sharing with, with guests and, and listeners. So let me know what you think. 
Now, um, because I did this show in person, it did actually cost me some cash, uh, about 15 bucks at the George Washington, uh, seven bucks for a coffee and a muffin and $47 for the parking garage, which I thought he said 27 and was stunned when my 50 only got me $3 change. Um, anyway, that all reminded me of how much I've been saving by doing podcasts remotely. That said, this was all worth it. I enjoyed the living hell out of this conversation, and I don't think it would have been the same if we did this remote just talking into our screens. Still, uh, if you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. Uh, for whatever that expense was, I'm fine for it. Uh, that's why I have my day job. But I do hope if you've got uh, money, you can support individuals and institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and, and other crowdfunding sources. Um, if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, uh, you could look to your local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, uh, various freedom funds. There are a lot of things out there and a lot of ways that you can help try to, to build a better world. So um, I hope you'll help. Now, last thing, I still have some copies left of the first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. If you want one, just drop me a line or visit haikuforbusinesstravelers.com. There's a form you can fill out there. Uh, it's free. You can kick in a few bucks for postage and production if you want, but it wasn't about making money. It was just about me sharing my art, such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs> <laughs>